every time we vote, we are standing up side by side with the founding fathers, with the men of Valley Forge, with patriots and pioneers throughout our history, with all those who dedicated their lives to making this a nation of, of the people, by the people, and for the people. Elections are the lifeblood of our democracy. They are the mechanism by which the American people choose who is going to rule on their behalf and for their interests and welfare. Without elections, there would be no way for the American people, for us, to exercise our legitimate sway on the future direction of this country. Polls now closed in half the country, and we are getting some interesting results coming in from those battleground states. If you're a Republican, you say, wow. If you're a Democrat, you say, uh-oh. Do you see Donald Trump is now starting to widen his lead? President Trump now with 54% of the vote. The president right now has the lead in the Keystone State. We're going to have a great night, and we're going to have much more in Portland. We're going to have a great four years. The 2020 election haunts the American mind. Here's where it gets really bizarre. At Fulton County, most populous county, it is Atlanta. They just stopped counting. Nevada, meanwhile, has stopped counting votes. They've all stopped counting for the night. All right, welcome back. This is CNN special live coverage, 1031 a.m. on the East Coast. Why am I giving you the time? Well, if you managed to sleep last night, Things changed. You may have gone to bed thinking this election was headed one way, and then you woke up and you saw things were different. Also overnight, Joe Biden pulled ahead in the state of Georgia. Joe Biden takes the lead in Pennsylvania. Okay, we have an announcement to make. Joe Biden has run for president three times, and the third time has turned out to be the charm. One side insists it was the most secure election in U.S. history. Let me begin with one immutable fact. The 2020 election was the most secure election in American history. It was the cleanest election, the safest election, the most secure election ever run. And make no mistake, there has been no evidence of any significant whites or widespread voter fraud. Let me say it again. The 2020 election was the most secure election in American history. Period. This same side accuses anyone who disagrees with them of perpetrating a big lie or the big delusion. The big lie keeps getting repeated. The big lie is just that, a big lie. And despite a relentless media barrage, the other side remains convinced there was widespread election fraud. What I saw was not a secure and transparent election. Poll watchers claim the Travis County Clerk's Office is locking them out. Last night there was a major software glitch that actually delayed the counting of all of the ballots. A look at election fraud and I want to look at secretaries of state who illegally changed the voter laws without the permission of their state legislature. There have been numerous attempts to prove election fraud. The van dropping off ballots in the early morning hours of November 4th, eight hours past the deadline. She said her mother was in a nursing home and did not have the mental capacity to vote. We've obtained video tonight that shows a man dropping several ballots into a drop box. Scottsdale woman pleads guilty to casting a ballot in her dead mother's name. Shows a man buying a registration form for an absentee ballot from a voter, giving him, quote, pocket money, unquote, of $200. Yet courts have refused to consider these cases on the merits. The Supreme Court rejecting an effort by Republicans to reverse President-elect Joe Biden's win in Pennsylvania. Now, the Supreme Court has rejected the Texas-led effort to toss out election results in four key states. Even some Republicans dismiss the idea of systematic fraud and call for us to move on. Fraud did not play a role in the outcome of the election. The election was fair, as fair as we've seen. Um, we simply did not win the election as Republicans for the presidency. Rather than reject uh, what happened on the 6th, reject the lies about the election, um, and make clear that a, a president who engaged in those activities can never be president again. But we can't move on unless we know the truth. Many other issues arise out of the 2020 election. <laughs> Did the January 6th protesters go to D.C. to mount an insurrection? 
It wasn't an insurrection. It was a primal scream. They wanted their elected leaders to adjudicate the claims of election fraud. The left's claim that this was the most secure election is also the foundation for the widespread censorship on social media of the so-called big lie. This morning, President Trump waking up without his favorite megaphone. You will never again see a tweet from President Trump. But is it a big lie? Is it a lie at all? Yeah. 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 Sound speed? Alright. Everybody got me? Yep. Alright. SRP. Hey, I'm Dinesh D'Souza, and this is season one, episode one of my new podcast. I started my podcast in early 2021 to speak the truth. But by simply asking questions about election fraud, you get booted from YouTube and Facebook. My podcast is sponsored by Salem Media, and I knew that other Salem hosts felt my frustration. Larry Elder, Dennis Prager, Eric Metaxas, Sebastian Gorka, Charlie Kirk. Let me begin by asking a very simple question. Do we feel confident or comfortable that we know the truth about what really happened in the 2020 election? I'm agnostic on this question, and I, I am awaiting more information. What about you, Eric? I think Dennis is a coward. Uh, I think, no, honestly, it's almost funny to me that so you're agnostic. And I think most Americans know that we don't know what happened and are not okay with that, by the way. I'm supposed to believe that a man who didn't campaign uh, or campaign from his basement got more votes than the first black president in America? I don't believe it. Charlie, we have crumbs. We have some evidence here and there that the picture is far from complete. Larry, in your race, you were, you were asked straight out, right? Do you believe that the 2020 election was stolen? What was your answer and do you abide by that answer as of right now? My, my answer was that Donald Trump is in Mar-a-Lago, and Joe Biden is in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The lawsuits did not succeed. Do, do I believe there was shenanigans? Do I believe there were irregularities? Absolutely, and said so. This is the probably the most loathed president I've ever seen. I thought Richard Nixon was loathed. I thought George W. Bush was loathed because of the Iraq war. I've never seen the level of vitriol against this man every single day. I think there was a study that found 91% of the news of ABC, NBC, CBS nightly news against Donald Trump was negative. Dog by a bogus two and a half year collusion uh, investigation. And then on the eve of the election, this Hunter Biden story drops, which shows that Joe Biden completely lied about his lack of knowledge of what his son was doing, and it was suppressed. And even the CEO of Twitter later on admitted that it was suppressed and shouldn't have been. That alone would have altered the election. You add all that up, my point is, this man is so low, I wouldn't put it past the Democrats to do virtually anything to make sure he doesn't get another four years. If I believed the president were a Nazi, I might steal an election. If we were Germans in yes. the 19th 30s, we'd steal yes. the election from Hitler if, if we I'm, If I'm that indoctrinated, of course I can justify it. I think it was Jane Fonda who said that COVID was God's gift to the left, yeah. right? It wrecks the empirical positives of the Trump economy, but here's the other. It enables a whole bunch of things on the other side to change the rules of the election. So the point is, in a COVID environment, is it not conceivable that Trump could have lost fair and square. I think millions of Americans know something went wrong and they have little pieces and no one's really put it together. They know that there was injustice. They know it in their gut. They know it through the bellwether counties where Donald Trump won almost every single one of the predictive counties that show who's going to be president. And then they also know it where they went to bed thinking Trump was going to have four more years and they woke up with the exact opposite. We have an individual who could fill a stadium with 60,000 supporters in 24 hours. By an individual, you know the famous photograph of the six empty circles at a Biden rally. We have an incumbent president who received more votes than any other incumbent president in American history, who actually got 
10 million more votes than he did four years prior and who received more support after four years of being called a racist and a white supremacist, more support from the Hispanic and black community than any Republican president since the 1960s. And he was beaten by a machine politician who couldn't speak clearly, who on the campaign stage would confuse his sister with his wife. It just stinks. Now, is it possible that the very success of Republicans down ballot, I'm talking about Republicans running for the House, running for the Senate, running for other races, the fact that the Republicans as a party did pretty well, but Trump lost, doesn't that work the other way and undercut the idea that there was systematic fraud? It's an anomaly because if he really, when a president really loses, he has tails. Is, what is it called? Co Coattails. Co Coattails. And, and, and the, the down ballots lose. But they won. Why didn't they cheat on all of those? Why didn't they cheat in Virginia with Yunkin? But, and who's to say they didn't cheat? Not all attempts at cheating succeed. Uh, you're, you're right. One okay. other question. In the Republican Party, I, I keep hearing people who seem annoyed at the revisiting of the 2020 election. Their attitude appears to be, let bygones be bygones. Let's just move on. I think the reason that many Republicans are saying let's move on is because bold accusations require bold evidence, and they haven't seen it. And because they know how vulnerable they are and how much they're going to be well, bashed. Well, yeah, you're, you're called a sore loser. You're called a conspiracy theorist. The people who say that, let's move forward, are people in the elite who see Donald Trump as an anomaly. You will not win in any district in this country because you have said that's, that the 2020 election was a fraud. And if they can't win on this issue, then don't use it. Well, it doesn't have to be the only issue, but their, their unwillingness even to speak up about it, I think, is despicable. Show me the proof, and I'll bet you they do speak up, just like I will speak more. And I'm not running for office. But I have not gone on board of, I know for a fact, this was a fraud. Show me the money. <laughs> Now look, I mean, the Democrats, they have a history of voter fraud. Yeah. Um, going back to Tammany Hall in the 19th century, we fast forward to LBJ stealing his first race in Texas, John F. Kennedy, the allegations that he stole the presidency uh, with voter fraud in Texas and in Illinois. They've done it before. I mean, you can have someone who has a criminal record and they're fully capable of robbing a bank, but did they rob the bank? Well, it looks like it. What does our friend Catherine think about all this? Yeah. Catherine's been a little quiet, but I think that that means that they're working on something. I think that you should uh, give her a call and see what she thinks. Hi, I'm Catherine Engelbrecht, founder and president of True the Vote. Agent Ash, how are you? Hey, I'm doing fine. Hey, listen, I'm here with Debbie. Hey, Catherine. Hey, Debbie. You know how crazy it is out there. Um, have you guys been digging into this whole issue of voter fraud? Well, we have been working on something big. It's uh, probably best we don't discuss it over the phone, but can we meet? Now, I've been working with uh, Greg Phillips. I don't know if I've ever introduced him to you, but he has a deep background in election intelligence. He's worked projects all over the world. He's a massive 30-year experience. Um, we decided to test a hypothesis, and we went uh, really big. And now, uh, we have something that we think you're going to really want to see. So uh, I'll send you the address separately. Now, Greg Phillips, what's your background that uh, prepares you for this kind of work? I've been in and around election intelligence and integrity for about 40 years. We've done investigations literally all over the world. It's a combination of uh, data acquisition, uh, data analysis, uh, occasionally some in-depth data mining. Our ability to uh, draw meaningful conclusions that link the who to the when to the where is significant in the space. Catherine, you started the group called True the Vote in the year 2010. What was your mission or objective? 
we just didn't have enough volunteers working at the polls in our local elections. So we began by training people to work in the polls. And then as we got further into it, we recognized, wow, some of the problems you see at the polls can be attributed to problems in the voter rolls. Well, what can we do about the voter rolls? And so it turned into something much bigger than we had anticipated. True the Vote has the largest store of election intelligence for the 2020 elections in the world. No one has more data than we do. So I started Through the Vote to ensure that every American voter has an opportunity to participate in elections. I think I became familiar with your work when you gave congressional testimony. Now that was in the year 2014. In fact, I met you through Debbie. And I think what's interesting is that you not only have known Debbie for years, but you trained her. In Absolutely. I was, I was a bilingual poll watcher. Oh, yes. So my, my Spanish language came in very handy. I was a poll watcher in Rosenberg. And the poll judge was telling this couple that came in, in Spanish, who to vote for. And of course, she didn't really realize that I knew Spanish, and so there we go. And you I, busted them. I busted them. <laughs> yeah. So Catherine, when you set up True the Vote, you set it up not so much, it's not a partisan organization. Is that because you saw shenanigans, problems with voting as, as coming out of both parties? Oh, absolutely. Plus, we need parity of parties at the polls. Well, you told me about this remarkable election in which you had vote harvesting and vote trafficking, but it was on behalf of a Republican candidate. Exactly. Uh, in North Carolina, it was unique in that it actually overturned an election. There's going to be a new election in the North Carolina Congressional District engulfed in a scandal over voting fraud. This all centers around allegations that an operative for Harris then hired a team of people to harvest absentee ballots, paying them between 2 and $3 a vote. So you have an activist, the guy's name was McCray Dallas, and he worked for the Bladen Improvement Association, which was a kind of an African-American get voters to the polls, but apparently they were doing all kinds of vote harvesting and he learned the strategy, then he broke with them. And he took his services to Mark Harris, a Republican, well actually a pastor who was running. Correct. And Harris won, he pulled it off. In 40 years of doing this, we've seen this over and over again. Sometimes the schemes are a little bit different. Sometimes it's people out banging on doors, gathering ballots. Sometimes the ballots are sent here, gathered here, deposited there. But the trafficking itself is always the same basic pattern. There's a nonprofit involved somewhere in the middle. There are people that are either collecting those ballots on the one hand or depositing those ballots on the other and getting paid for it. In no case is it is acceptable to be paid for your ballot or to accept some form of remuneration for your ballot. And in no way, in no time, is that legal. I noticed, Catherine, that in the immediate aftermath of the election when there were a lot of accusations and charges flying around, all reflecting these suspicions of something went deeply wrong, charges of foreign intervention, charges of machines. You and your organization were kind of dead silent. I got the impression that you were looking for a different approach. Given the outliers that were introduced in, in such a major way in 2020, uh, namely the privately funded drop boxes, the mass mail out of ballots, the hypothesis was if you were going to cheat, how might one go about this? That would be provable, trackable, traceable. You said there might be some, let's just call them bad actors, who are delivering ballots systematically and, and, and illicitly to these mail-in drop boxes and there might be a way to track them and to bust them. We didn't know. We decided we we're going to let the data tell the tale and we collected together a team of highly skilled contractors and put together a plan to see where the data would take us. What, Greg, is geo-tracking? So the idea is to collect the signals that are emitted from your phone. Your cell phone is delivering information to apps that are collecting that thing. So there are four key coordinates, the lat long, the elevation, and the time. And with that data, we can then build a pattern of life around you. So that phone's here right now. Well, where's it going to be at 5 o'clock? And where's it going to be tonight? Well, here's my cell phone. My, my cell phone is off. Can, you, can I be geo-tracked even with the cell phone being off? Possibly. 
depending on the apps depending that are on the, the phone. Apps, depending That's on what marketing apps. companies do all day, every day. And, and this is the point. We were just at we were at the yeah. Apple store and at CBS, yeah. and on both occasions, they knew right. where you they were, knew. evidently. Absolutely. And they were telling you about specials, yeah. and yeah. they were so people right. have experience of this. There's three hundred thousand or so apps that that gather that data and then they sell it to brokers. Isn't it also true that this geo-tracking has now become a vital tool for the military, for the intelligence agencies, and for law enforcement? Indeed, they're using it almost every day. I'll say that there's no question amongst anyone that I know in the community that many, if not all, of the people that were involved in the situation at the Capitol on January 6th were being tracked previous to January 6th because they already knew what their pattern of life was. Yeah. They already knew who to look at. Many of the people who stormed the U.S. Capitol on January 6th left digital footprints that law enforcement has used in making arrests. You're saying they must have known about these people before because some of those guys were arrested one day, three days, five days after January 6th, and that's not enough time to do the geo-tracking analysis. The very idea that you could go from the afternoon of January 6th to acquiring the data, tracking the data, unmask who actually owns that phone, which the government is required to do, and then get it to a grand jury, make an arrest in 72 hours? Impossible. It's, it's, not, it's not possible. They had to have been tracking the people in advance. But the fact of the matter is, these techniques are used every single day by law enforcement, the intelligence community, the Department of Defense. Was geo-tracking part of the way that the CIA was able to identify bin Laden? It certainly played a role. It's even more sophisticated today than it was when bin Laden was disposed of. More and more apps are participating in this this program, if you will. The reliability of geo-tracking is not substantially different from the reliability of a fingerprint or the reliability of DNA if it identifies your phone. Now, I could have given my phone to Debbie, but the simple truth of it is my phone was there on this particular date, and there's absolutely no question about that, That's right? Correct. Now, you decided to purchase through these brokers that make this information available to companies. They make it available all, all kinds of places to buy data. Uh, talk, let's talk about the methodology. You identified data in certain places, and by and large, you focused on the states where the election was decided. Tell us what are the areas that you bought data for, and what were you looking for? And what's the time period? October 1st through the election. In Georgia, we actually bought from October 1st through January 6th after the runoff. So we went in, we decided to do the Atlanta metro area because it picks up some rural areas, it picks up some urban areas, it picks up some suburban areas, 309 drop boxes in, in the area. So we thought, okay, well, this is a pretty good test. We, in essence, sort of fenced around those. Geofencing. Geofencing. So and then we were able to make purchase of data of people that had been near those drop boxes, but also near the organizations. Across the country, we bought 10 trillion signals. When they give you this data, this data that you then have to go through, what does this data look like? Well, it's a massive data transfer. We have more than a petabyte of data. You're talking about transacting hundreds of terabytes, so it's a significant move of data. You have 10 trillion signals, that's, that's a lot of signals. So what was the criterion that you set? Final decision was they had to have been to 10 or more drop boxes, meaning unique visits inside of a space, and five or more visits to one of the one or more of these organizations. Those were the outliers. It was such an aberrant pattern. So what you're saying, I mean, it seems to me there's no reason for someone to go to even two drop boxes, but you're saying that maybe there's a conceivable reason someone did that. Let's identify a large number of drop boxes and multiple trips, and that way we're going to catch not all the offenders, right, but the worst offenders. The way we would describe it is we want to absolutely ensure that we don't have false positives, meaning including people that should not have been included. We're not in any way saying that this is all there is. We're just saying that based on our criteria, that we identified in Atlanta 242 people 
that went to an average of 24 drop boxes in eight organizations during a two-week period. 242 mules. Now let's pause for a second. What is a mule? When we started the project, we had to figure out how are we going to describe the individuals and the, and the elements involved. And to us, it felt a lot like a cartel. It felt a lot like trafficking. Uh, it can be trafficking in drugs, trafficking in humans. In this instance, it's ballot trafficking. And so we began to use that vernacular. A mule is, by our definition, a person that is involved in picking up ballots from locations and running them to the drop boxes. So you have the collectors on the one hand, you have the stash houses, which are the, the nonprofits, and then you have the, the mules that are doing the drops. What do we know about them? Who are they? Well, first let me say, this is not grandma out walking her dog. Bad backgrounds, bad reputations. We've had uh, you know encounters with several that are you know not terribly positive. Violent guys. Can be. They are interested in one thing, that's money. Do we know, by the way, how much they get paid? According to the people that have shared information with us, it's generally $10 a ballot. In the, in the Georgia runoff, that number was higher. 2020, of course, was the year of the Antifa riots, the BLM riots, and it was all going on in the months and weeks leading up to the election. Right. And so in the data, you have geo-tracking data of the drop boxes, but you also have data on the rioters. There were several different violent BLM Antifa riots in Atlanta. In one of them, we had three dozen of our mules participate in these violent riots. There's an organization that tracks the device IDs across all violent protests around the world. We took a look at our 242 mules in Atlanta, and sure enough, dozens and dozens and dozens of our mules show up on the ACLID databases. So again, this is not Grandma out walking her dog. These are, you know, violent criminals sometimes. There's not just a criminal element, but there is an ideological element element and that there's an overlap between people. I mean, you're not going to go to an Antifa riot and find it overpopulated with patriots or Christians or Republicans. These are people on generally the far left. And turns out that these are people who also help to make up the mule population. I think that's also uh, borne out in our target organizations themselves. They're not like Republican organizations. Either right? left-wing right. democratic <laughs> organizations. Yeah. Work. Let's Zoom in here. So the mule is the delivery man, the, mule is the delivery or woman, and, and what you're saying is they have a starting point or multiple starting points, and then they have the end point, and the end point is the drop box. That's right. Right. That's right. But you're saying that they're, they they get the ballots from somewhere, and then they go deposit them in right. multiple drop boxes. One of the questions that will come up in the work that we've done is, well, how do you know that this wasn't just somebody that's got a big family and they just deposited a bunch of ballots once? Or how do you know that this person didn't just work at a, at a location that is near a drop box and so they're constantly going by a drop box? And the elements that, that are uh, additive here, the going to the nonprofits, the ability to identify the pattern of approach to a drop box and that it is going not past a drop box and on, but directly to a drop box and back to another point and then to another drop box. All of these things. I mean, isn't the timing significant? If some guy's going to a drop box at 2 a.m. in the morning, presumably he's not like out for a walk. Right. So we're going to show you a visual, a pattern of life that someone can see and look at rather than just a whole spreadsheet of numbers being able to look at it in this manner. What you see here on the screen is a single person on a single day in Atlanta, Georgia. They went to 28 drop boxes in five organizations in one day. What are the orange dots? Those are drop boxes. And what is the blue tracks? That is a smoothed out pattern of life so that we could take the sort of the movement of the individual cell phone signals marry them together into something that's visual so that you can see movement on the individual. To get to some of these drop boxes, you had to be intentional. 
You had to get off the highway. You had to go on surface streets. You had to turn in somewhere in order to get to those drop boxes. And the circles, I take it, reflect the nonprofit centers. Are that the places where the ballots originate? The stash houses, where the ballots are collected and handed to the mules to take to the drop boxes. Now let's move over to Arizona. How many mules in Arizona? A little over 200. A little over 200. In, in Phoenix alone. The reason I think this is all very significant is because these were very close states, right? What was the margin in Georgia? Uh, 10 or 11,000, I think, in the end. In the end. And Arizona also extremely close. Yeah, very close. Um, then you moved on to... Wisconsin. But our initial look was in Milwaukee. Gross numbers were a little down, but the average number of visits to the drop boxes was up. So instead of having only 24 unique visits, I think we averaged 28. I mean, maybe Wisconsin. I've heard people in Milwaukee are really hardworking, and maybe they just went overtime. <laughs> and then let's go to Michigan. Uh, we have more than 500 mules that we've identified in Michigan. Again, the number of boxes is lower. Now, where in Michigan? Uh, Detroit mainly. But we have people in Detroit that went to more than 100 drop boxes. I mean, this is stunning because it's like, I cannot think of a rational, kind of innocent reason for someone to do that. It just doesn't exist. No. So any reasonable person would say, you're onto something big here. We should take a closer look. Let's go to Pennsylvania, a critical state. I think it was Pennsylvania that really gave Biden the election. Philadelphia alone, we've identified more than 1,100 mules at rates well beyond anything we'd seen. Closer to 50 drop boxes each. Each guy going to 50 each, drop boxes? Each. 1,100. We saw people driving back and forth to New Jersey across the bridge. But you're saying the ballots may not even be from Philadelphia or from Pennsylvania. Well, we're saying, we're saying somebody should but you're saying that the origin yeah. point appears to be Jersey. Now, running 1,100 mules times 50, we are 50,000 drop box visits by the mules alone in Philadelphia or greater Philadelphia area. Now, as you were assessing this data, you had the two of you, and I'm not sure which of you came up with this, a genius idea in my view. For, it was your, <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course, who else? Well, to validate your data. We chose to uh, look at two murders that were uh, ebbing on cold case status. And in Atlanta, eight-year-old Sequoia Turner was killed by rounds of gunfire shot into a car. It happened just outside this Wendy's parking lot. Bought the data and the team got to work. You could see visually that there were only a handful of unique devices that could possibly have pulled the trigger. So this is the area, and this is where the Wendy's was. And are you saying that each green dot is the same guy, yeah. each, but moving color. through time? Each color is one person. The shooting actually occurred right here in, in this parking lot, sort of inside of this circle are really the only potentially legitimate shooters. Uh, each of these devices has a unique device ID, and we turned the bulk of this information over to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Now, I read, they've arrested two suspects. They have. Two suspected gang members will appear in court this morning on charges that include the shooting death of eight-year-old Sequoia Turner. And isn't it true that this tracking, these movements, this parallels exactly the work you're doing with the mules. Exactly. It's one thing to have the scientific evidence, which is persuasive on its own merits, but do you have video evidence? We do. How much of it do you have? Four million minutes of surveillance video around the country. Official surveillance video of these mail-in drop boxes. Yes. How do you get it? You can file for open records requests. Any citizen can do this. It was a, a very difficult series of steps that had to be followed to procure the actual surveillance video. Do you have video in Georgia? We do. Is it video from the presidential election, the runoff election, or both? Both. Do you have video from other states? Some video from Arizona. We have recently learned video was specifically turned off on particular drop boxes. In which state? Arizona. Wisconsin, it turns out, 
even though the rules required them to have video. Did they do the video? No, they did not. There should be video on every Dropbox. Indeed. Given today's kind of cost of technology, it would not have been that hard to do it. And you sent me a screenshot, Catherine, where you were requesting video. And I believe it was the state of Georgia saying this video does not exist and we can't tell you why it doesn't exist. Right. That was in, in Fulton County. And we have correspondence like that from a lot of states. In the absence of video, and that geospatial data is key to decoding you know, what the greater scheme was. But in the case of uh, what we're going to show you now, what kicks it up a notch is that we have the geospatial data to support the video. Let's talk about some of the videos. So we're going to show you a couple different ones. This particular individual we have um, in a number of different locations at a number of different times. He's actually a mule. This is the official surveillance video of Georgia. Absolutely. And so as the person pulls up, they don't even bother parking. Of course, it's the middle of the night, so why would they? It gets out, approaches the box. When people walk up with intention to cheat, they look around, they basically walk fairly quickly. They try to step them in, they try to get out of there. In this case, he drops a few on the ground, pick them up, stuff them into the box. Then he hustles back and hustles out of there. So this is what it looks like. It doesn't necessarily look like, you know, hundreds of ballots being stuffed in. You don't need a whole lot of fraud. You just need a little in the right places over time. Is there a way to estimate or even roughly how many ballots are being tossed into a box at a given time? It might be three or five or six or ten or something like that. The idea is to stay under the radar. And as Greg said, the number is, you know, three, five, ten ballots. But then they're not done for the day either. They're going place to place to place, day upon day upon day. And so that will not show up in your chain of custody documents, your tracking documents that would identify a big blip. I mean, they're not going up and dumping in, you know, buckets full of ballots. Uh, on the other hand, we've seen circumstances where it appears that buckets full of ballots showed up. There's one box in Gwinnett County that had a chain of custody document with 1,962 ballots noted on this. And first of all, that's roughly 10 times what we normally see. We sorted through the geodata, found a few hundred people. Okay, well, that's pretty odd. We have video of all of this. And guess what it shows? 271 people approached that ballot drop box during that 25 hour period. 271, 1,962 ballots were deposited. Wow. Here are election officials pulling out of that drop box two full duffel bags containing over 1,900 ballots. Let's look at another one. Yeah, let's take a look at... Uh, Interesting thing about this person is the device seems to live in South Carolina. So this person isn't even from Georgia. She was here uh, during both election cycles, uh, but is not a resident of the state. But as she approaches the drop box, she never looks at the trash can, right? She's looking the other way. But the other thing she has is she has gloves on. What one of our analysts noticed was these surgical gloves only appeared from December 23rd forward in the runoff. So we didn't see a lot of them previous to December 23rd, and we couldn't figure out why. And then it just dawned on us, well, on December 22nd, there was an indictment handed down in Arizona for people that had stuffed ballots, and the way the FBI nailed them was fingerprints. And then lo and behold, the next day, and, and days forward. So this video is now from the Georgia runoffs. This, this, this is, is January this is, of 21. This That's particular right. one is at approximately 1 o'clock in the morning on January the 5th. Stuffs her ballots in there. It's like a small stack -ish, maybe three, maybe four. Takes them off and then puts them in a trash can that she never looked at. So she knew it was there. She knew it was there, right? And so we have her on a number of locations. She's Ill an out-of-state mule, and then this is in no way the only drop box that she attended. That's right. No, she she's, goes to dozens and dozens over the course of these two elections. Who's next? What you're going to see is he approaches the drop box on his bike. He also has a backpack on. 
pulled the ballots out of his backpack. Taking his time. Taking his time, digging around, looking for some ballots. Finally gets out, pulls them out. Okay, now I'm set. And he'll put them in. But you also see him get sort of frustrated as he starts to leave. Because guess what? At this point, they had started requiring the mules, apparently, to take pictures of the stuffing of the ballots. It appears that that's how they get paid. So they take a picture, and stuff it in, they take a picture, not a selfie, but a picture of the, the actual ballot going in. But this guy gets frustrated, so he actually has to park his bike, get off. So if you were there just casting your own ballot, what reason in the world would you have to come back and take a picture of the box? And he kneels down. Looking Later around. He yeah. takes some pictures. Okay, the next one. Yeah, so let me show you dog guy. So dog guy, middle of the day, this is actually at a polling place. So the people in line are waiting to go in and vote early. They're doing it the right way. Okay, now, now you've got some other people going to walk up. This lady doesn't care, but this guy, this next guy cares. He's watching the whole thing. That guy so looks up, talks to him. Got the ballots under his arm already. Now he's got the rest that he pulled out of the bag. And he's going to get his camera ready to take the pictures as he puts them in there. If you consider the brazenness of this, right? This is the middle of the day. There's people sitting there watching you cheat. But people that are doing it the right way. But it's difficult for them to know what to do. That's right. Except right. observe and maybe say, what's going on? Here? What right. did I just see? They wonder, what does this all even mean? If this is happening in broad daylight and nobody's doing anything to stop it. And so these are the kind of things, four million minutes of this. This was an organized effort to subvert a free and fair election. This is organized crime. You can't look at this data in its aggregate and believe anything otherwise. That's especially true when you consider that in places like Georgia, it was only decided by 10,000, 12,000 votes. And you look at 5,000 visits just from our mules, it's not a leap to say, yes, this would have made a difference. Adding these numbers up, we have 2,000 plus mules based upon not searching these whole states. And right. remember, we're, we're only talking about a small number of states. You didn't, you, we're not talking about the whole country. We're, we're not talking, talking about, about whole states. We're not even talking about whole states. Right. That's right. And we're also talking about a gross undercount of the actual number of mules because you set a high bar. They had to go to 10 drop boxes. So if there's a mule who went to seven drop boxes, you wouldn't, you wouldn't oh. catch that guy. And they had to go to nonprofits. So they had to meet those two criteria and then go to one of the GO fence drop boxes if they met the two criteria but went to a post office box we're not going to look at them one of the slogans of the democrats through all this debate has Good been idea, make every vote count and i think we can now see in a chilling way that this is kind of what they mean what they mean is it doesn't matter if all kinds of illegal ballots are being dropped in let's just count them now the narrative needs to be that this is the most secure election. This is the most fabulous election we've ever had. Pay no mind to the millions of Americans that are saying something is not right. This does not make sense. Nothing to see here. Just smile and wave, boys. I mean, wouldn't it be an accurate summary to say that these voter bills that the Democrats are desperate to enact, to federalize the election, isn't it that they want to take all these special provisions that have enabled what we've described or you've described in the 2020 election and make it permanent? If we don't wake up and do the hard roll up your sleeves work that it's going to take to reel this all back together, then yes, all the pieces are in place for our election system to be in permanent lockdown. And it will be done under the watchful eye of a media that will tell you it's all just fine. It seems like they are subverting democracy in the <coughs> public pretense of protecting it. Absolutely. And it won't stop unless we stop it. If I look across the swath of Republicans, yeah. this is not the kind of issue that they seem to be comfortable with. It's almost like they would rather endure. That's right. Mm -hmm. As I said. Well, it's a, it's a gamble, right? Because yeah. the ones that are enduring mm -hmm. are currently 
elected and in power. When you watch these brazen acts and nobody says a word because they're scared that they're going to be sued, because they're scared that they're going to be canceled, because they're scared that they're going to be silenced, that kind of chilling effect is exactly what they want. And as I said, on the other side of fear is freedom. If you never get past the fear, you're never free. Let's sum up what we know. Do we know for sure that this was not, in fact, far from the most secure election in history? It was not. We know that for a fact. Do we know for a fact that there was coordinated, systematic fraud in all the key states where the election was decided? Yes. Yes. And therefore, does it follow that the people who suspected fraud, even though they didn't have the proof, their suspicion was right? Absolutely. Their instincts are right. And moreover, that the states that are trying to do something about systematic fraud by restoring a modicum of, let's call it the old rules, checking your voter ID, checking signatures. Uh, you want a mail-in ballot? You know what? you got to request an absentee ballot. We're not going to send 20 million ballots out there and see what comes back. That these voter integrity laws, far from being voter suppression, are actually a legitimate way to make sure that the people who vote are actually eligible to vote. A hundred percent accurate. That's absolutely correct. What you are seeing is a crime. These are fraudulent votes. In two of our five key states, you were allowed to give your ballot to be delivered by a family member or a caregiver. This is vote harvesting, but it's not the same as ballot trafficking. In no state in America is it legal for nonprofit organizations to collect ballots and pay mules to deliver them to mail-in drop boxes. Now we come to the most important question of all. Was the magnitude of vote trafficking in these key swing states enough to tip the balance in the 2020 presidential election? Let's first narrow in on just our 2,000 mules. Their average number of Dropbox visits, 38. Their average number of illegal ballots deposited per visit, five. That's 380,000 illegal votes. But was this sufficient to put Biden in the White House? To answer that question, we must look at each key state. In Michigan, 500 mules, averaging 50 drop box visits and five illegal ballots per drop. That's 125,000 illegally trafficked votes, not quite the 154,000 vote difference between Trump and Biden. So Michigan, with its 16 electoral votes, stays in the Biden column. In Wisconsin, 100 mules, averaging 28 drop box visits and five illegal ballots per drop. That's 14,000 illegally trafficked votes. 6,000 votes short to give Trump the win. So using only our mules, Wisconsin's 10 electoral votes stays in the Biden camp. But now we come to Georgia, 250 mules, averaging 24 drop box visits and five illegal ballots per drop. That's 30,000 illegally trafficked votes, far more than the 12,000 vote difference between Trump and Biden. So Georgia with 16 electoral votes, moves over into the Trump column. In Arizona, the numbers are roughly the same. 200 mules, averaging 20 drop box visits and five illegal ballots per drop. That's 20,000 illegal votes. Again, these illegal votes are substantially more than the 10,000 vote margin that gave the state's 11 electoral votes to Biden. In Philadelphia, Pennsylvania alone, 
1,100 mules, averaging 50 Dropbox visits and five ballots per visit. That's 275,000 illegal votes, again, comfortably exceeding the 80,000 vote margin between Trump and Biden. So Pennsylvania's 20 electoral votes goes for Trump. Shockingly, even this narrow way of looking at just our 2,000 mules in these swing states gives Trump the win with 279 electoral votes to Biden's 259. But no one thinks that our 2,000 mules were the only mules trafficking illegal votes. To widen the search, Greg and his team lowered the criterion from 10 or more to five or more drop boxes. This revealed a huge upsurge in the number of mules from 2,000 to 54,000. 54,000 mules. Next, they used a very conservative estimate of just three ballots per drop box visit. Now, when we multiply this increased number of mules times the five drop box visits per mule times just three illegal votes per drop, we find election fraud on an astonishing scale. In Wisconsin, 83,565 illegal votes were trafficked. In Georgia, 92,670. In Pennsylvania, 209,505. In Michigan, 226,590. And in Arizona, 207,435. Using this calculus, Trump would have won all the key states. And the final electoral vote, 305 to 233. I wanted to get my Salem colleagues' take on what I'd learned here. There is four million minutes of video. Well, so official footage. This is official surveillance footage. It's indisputable. It was taken by the state itself. That's the only place that the, the video left, came from. I think, did not anticipate that anyone would go through this video. So this is uh, one o'clock in the morning. Don't we all vote at one o'clock in the morning? <laughs> Right, right, right. This is, seems silly, but somebody asked me, they go, how do we know this is not normal mail? <laughs> this is a ballot drop box. Right. Okay, this is not the mailbox right, where, right. You, where you write your mom. She's got gloves on. She's got gloves on. And what does she do with the gloves? Ooh. Whoopsie daisy. Hang on, she walked straight past That's that wrong. cannon and You gotta it. show that again. It's hilarious. <laughs> so look, look, she just walks in. So this is not the first time she's done. No. So that one was in Georgia, is that right? Yes. yes. So in Georgia, it is illegal to turn in anyone but yourself or your family member's ballot. It is illegal. Right. It right. is illegal. Right. So forget the outcome. That's an illegal practice, what you just saw. That's right. Video number two. Dog guy. This is called dog guy. See, they got these people in pictures, too. What? <coughs> taking pictures. Jail. Why would you do that? So you can paint. paint. That's it's business. business. It's business. What, what, business do you, what do you suspect if if you had actually caught this person at that moment, hand me those ballots, mm -hmm. and the person did? What do you think you would see? Whose name is on it, in in your opinion? Ineligible voters, people that have moved. Would you see legitimate ballots? Yeah, There's an ambiguity in what you're saying. The ballot itself is legitimate. No, no, that I right. I, it's I, not. It's not a, it's not a fake know, it's not piece a of paper. Fit, yeah. right. <laughs> but again, remember when you mail in a ballot, you have a security envelope with the signature verification standard that's been all but washed away. And as soon as it's taken out of that envelope, then you then you have a disconnect and it's the ballot a, it's is It's a private. virgin sheet of paper. The ballot the, the is The only private. ID is on the envelope on the outside. But this is an example of multiple ballots. So this is uh, not- 3.57 a.m. Prime voting time. Okay. It's gotta, gotta this, be the lines. This person comes up right. and what you're gonna see is um, when you try to put too many ballots in. He needs a shoehorn. <laughs> and we have lots of those where they're just jamming them in and then they fall on the ground. And when you can jam well, them... I mean, this alone is, to say the least, suggestive. Who voting at 3.57 a.m. with a whole bunch of ballots? And, and then uh, being able to match that ping where he's standing there to the next place he goes. So we're seeing videos of one. Right. But each one of these, you know... 
went to on average 23 video, times the same guy going different places yes. yes right this is their pattern of life so in one night this person this mule went across six counties to 27 different drop boxes yes. five different in organizations one in one so he in was one getting the ballots from the organization correct yeah. the republicans had no idea this was going on during the election but trump to his credit tweeted out in july Mail-in ballots are a disaster, yep. have, and he was attacked so hard by Kemp and Ducey and so many. But that was, he didn't have this information, obviously. He's instinct, though. No. Yeah. Ended up being right. This is the tip of the iceberg. You're talking about extraordinary criminal activity, but there's a ton more, you would guess, that you have not even touched. You are talking about two, three hundred thousand ballots that were just harvested in only the old geolocated locations. But you are talking, what, five percent of America? Less. Less than 5%. Okay. So the case closed. Sorry, gentlemen, lady. Case closed. All right. So I do a heroic thing that not necessarily others here do. I read the New York Times every day. That's and crazy. I, it, well, well, sorry for it, you. It's my martyrdom. <laughs> they claim all of these places we have found maybe four, maybe 50 phony ballots. These aren't phony ballots. Right. Okay. okay. So wait, this wait, is wait, a wait, very novel. Wait. They're phony names. No, 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 no. no. There's no name on the ballot, Dennis. Okay, let's say we got access to every single ballot thrown into the ballot boxes. Would we be able to prove this is a fraud? It's the perfect crime because it cannot be curated after it is committed because the evidence has no connection to the person who is meant to be voting. That's the problem. As soon as it gets taken out of the envelope, the identity right, of the voter we're, we're disappears. So the vote from John Doe is from a John Doe who is dead or a John Doe who was moved. Is that correct? Or voted or, somewhere or, else. Or, 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 or voted so. Why is that not provable? There is an easy way to bust it, but it's not the way you think. It's not to go find the ballots in the ballot mix. You can't do that. The way to find it is these guys have the cell phone identification of all the mules, all of them. So law enforcement has to step in at this point, and their next step what were you doing seven is times to go, go in I interview that, the right. mules. Who paid you? Right. Where did you get the money? Will any state's law enforcement do this? This is a big question. The mules aren't going to fess up. They're, they know they're participating in something that is... Well, you, got, you got them on videotape. You've got 2,000 people who are committing felonies. Right. I'd like you to just reflect about what you've learned today and how you're feeling and thinking about it. It's just sickening to me. This is jaw-dropping. What you showed is frightening. Republicans had no clue this was going on. I wondered whether any Republicans who did know. Investigative journalist Heather Mullins interviews a whistleblower hired by the National Republican Senatorial Committee. I was hired by the NRSC. My job uh, was basically to watch the ballot boxes, and this was for the early voting in Georgia. So that started on December 14th and ended on the 31st of December, and we would monitor that box from 8 to 8 all day long. So, consequently, during those two uh, two weeks, um, I monitored those boxes indiscriminately. I would move around through the different areas in the boxes and watch them 30 minutes here, an hour there. And then I would start to see things where I'd see people walking up with uh, backpacks and they were unloading large numbers of ballots, stuff from it in the box. Um, recorded some of that and took pictures of it and dates and times and those things. Um, I spotted a place from Texas, from Colorado, um, South Carolina, North Carolina, and I just thought that was odd that all these states were coming in. These people would get out and I'd watch them get out and they'd go up to the ballot, stuff the ballot in the ballot box. I thought that was kind of odd. So, you know, we took pictures of those things when we took pictures, recorded license plates and those things. And then um, I uploaded those photographs to a drop box. Then when it came to the, um, the Georgia runoff, the actual day of the election, which was January 5th, um, I was up there, it was early in the morning. Now, there were Stacey Abrams people all along the sidewalk up there. How did you know that they were Stacey Abrams people, though? Well, they had those masks on that said vote. Okay. She has one of those things they had. This was during COVID, right? And mm -hmm. They were part of that initiative. I knew that she was part of that initiative that she had going on about get out the vote kind of thing. So it was Democratic Party and it was Abrams people that were, you know, they were all interacting with each other. And then the local um, Democratic Party 
chairman was there also about 6.30 that evening. Um, we noticed uh, there was a, a, a couple, a female couple, these two ladies had run up and they had a big stack of ballots. And uh, we were standing there and they tried to shove the ballots in there and I looked at her taking pictures and the other gentleman took some video and everything and uh, she turned around and looked at us and she said, what are you doing? And I said, well, we're taking a picture. And she said, well, you can't do that. And I said, yes, I can. And uh, she got mad. And she ran off the sidewalk and left. So you're saying the NRSC was made aware that there were people stuffing yes. drop boxes at specific yes. dates and times? Yes. So with what you witnessed during your time watching these drop box, do you believe that that was enough for law enforcement to get involved? Oh, definitely. But after several weeks, no contact or anything, you know, I just... Now, now, so you're saying, though, if, if somebody had contacted you, you would be willing to testify to these things and, and give those depositions under oath? I would have had to. Yeah. I would have had to. Why don't you show that? Catherine, hey. Greg just interviewed an informant in Arizona who's now cooperating with authorities. Oh, wow. Okay. Check your email. Okay, awesome. I'll do it. Thanks so much. Okay, bye. Hey, honey. Yeah. Take a look at this. So this is, uh, I remember Greg was um, going to interview that mule. Yeah. And um, so we got the video. Thank you again for It's a concealing our identity. So what, what was your what was your job? Like, what, what, what were you doing? A uh, receptionist. So at some point, um, you were asked or, or sort of instructed, I guess, to start receiving people's ballots. I was just instructed uh, to go ahead and receive ballots from various uh, people, females mostly. And, um, and on Friday, they would come and pick up uh, payment. I, I assumed it was payments for what they were doing. So they would, during the week, they would bring them in mm -hmm. at various times and then you would pay them, like, all on a Friday? Mm -hmm. Is that kind of how it went? Yes. Interesting. And then I would get a call uh, to find out how many ballots were brought in and if they were already pre-filled out first. And she would come to the office, look at them, and then before she left, she would either take them herself, but other times she would uh, ask me if I could drop them off at the library. So what was the instruction? To uh, just to drop them off. In the <laughs> drop box? Uh -huh, the drop box. Uh, the early ballots. Can you give me how many, an idea of how many you personally put in the box? Hundreds? Could have been, yes. Um, and was there a reason they wanted you, she wanted you to go to that drop box as opposed to maybe City Hall or something? There's no cameras. There's no cameras there. And she would want me to take it in the evening when it was dark also. Do you think this is widespread in Yuma County or elsewhere? I would say it is. So do you think that people you know in San Luis, they believe that their vote matters? I don't even think they know the meaning of what voting is. Do you personally think that the elections in San Luis are free and fair? No. They're fixed. They've been fixed. They already know, seriously, who is going to win the next election before it even happens. How do you think this affects the community, especially the Hispanic community? Because it seems like they're preying on minorities. They're an easy target because most of the Hispanic that live in the town uh, are not well educated as far as the law. They look at it mostly as, oh, she's trying to help us because we're older, because she's having someone come and pick it up at my house, because I don't drive. Most of them, maybe, I would say honestly, 90% of the elderly that live in San Luis don't drive or have relatives that are willing to drive them to do this, to go to the voting polls. Back when I first moved into the city of San Luis, I did have somebody come and knock on my door and ask for my ballot. And it was somebody I knew and that I had known for many years since I was a child. And up to this day, uh, that person does not talk to me because I said there was no way I was giving them my ballot. 
What a brave woman to do this. Totally. I call it the Mexican Mafia, seriously. Because uh, they, they work like that. It seems like we need to do a better job of maybe educating folks or, or helping people understand that this stuff's not okay. I offered <laughs> a long time ago. Uh, but, again, they told me, oh, don't do it, because you're going to end up in the trash can in pieces. What do you think it's going to take to get the, this trafficking to stop? For people to get caught and to pay the price. Wow. Unbelievable. We know that the mules got their stashes of ballots from these activist organizations. But where did the activist organizations get the ballots from? Hans von Spakovsky is a former member of the Federal Election Commission, a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation, and co-author of the book, Our Broken Elections. I will say election fraud is bipartisan, but most of the cases I see are unfortunately the Democratic Party. Hans, you just watched a mule kind of fessing up about participating in this trafficking operation. Is this kind of a mule operation something familiar to you? But unfortunately, this is so common in some parts of America, particularly the Hispanic community, that they have a special name there. There they call them politiqueros. And these are individuals who are paid by campaigns or political parties to go into neighborhoods and collect absentee ballots to pressure and coerce voters. People who observe election fraud have commented that absentee ballot fraud or mail ballot fraud is the easiest and the most common type of election fraud. Why is that? Well, because they're the only kind of ballot that is voted outside the supervision of election officials and outside the observation of poll watchers. Transparency, as you know, is very important in the election process. And there's no one there at a, a voter's home to observe what's happening. Also, remember, when you're in a polling place, you fill out your ballot and you then deposit it directly into the ballot box. That obviously is not what happens with absentee ballots. There are some states, I believe about half of them, about 27 states, that allow voter harvesting. And by voter harvesting, what we mean is that you are allowed to give your ballot to someone else right. and ask them to deliver it. Now, are there any states in which you're allowed to pay mules to deliver ballots to drop boxes? No, you're not supposed to be doing that. Uh, and allowing vote trafficking to begin with is a huge mistake because you're giving third party strangers, you know, candidates, uh, campaign staffers, party activists, all people who have a stake in the outcome of the election, you're giving them the ability to handle something very valuable, a ballot. Voter fraud is almost in, incalculably rare in the United States. Does it ever happen? Okay, occasionally it does happen. But it doesn't happen on a national scale. It doesn't affect the outcome. It would affect the outcome. I read these days constantly that election fraud, well, it could occur. But those cases are extremely rare. They're so episodic, they don't have the ability to tip an election. Is that true? Fraud happens often enough that elections get overturned. I mean, just go back three years to 2018 and a congressional race was overturned. I, I can cite to you another case in Mississippi. It was just overturned by a court because of fraud. Same thing in Florida. But look, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Now, we've shown that you've got these mules who are picking up these ballots at various vote stash houses. Hans, where do these organizations get ballots? Well, to quote Shakespeare, uh, let me count the ways. You know, everything from filling out absentee ballot request forms for voters, but having the ballots sent to them, to actually going to the voters and obtaining the ballots from them, to stealing them out of mailboxes, to actually using high quality photocopy machines to make their own ballots. Look, these cases unfortunately go on all the time. You can go to 2018, which wasn't that long ago, in North Carolina. 
Leslie McRae Dowless is accused of mishandling absentee ballots in North Carolina's 9th District. Dowless would frequently obtain this report from the Board of Elections looking for the date an absentee ballot was mailed and if it had been returned. Ginger Eason, who first told me she was hired to pick up ballots, and Kelly Hendricks, who testified she did the same thing. What would you do with the ballots after you picked them up? Take them straight to the office in Dublin and hand them over to McRae. And I don't know what happened to him after that. I know there was stacks of them on his desk. There was testimony in the case that his staffers were falsely signing as witnesses on those absentee ballots. Because he had done this before, he actually apparently had signatures of voters from prior elections in his offices. Voter rolls are in notoriously bad shape. States do a very bad job of taking people off who are no longer eligible because they've died or moved away. And it's very easy to get hold of a state's voter registration list. So, you know, if somebody's on the list and they haven't voted in 10 years, you're probably pretty safe in trying to cast a ballot on their behalf. In, on their behalf. Remember, in states that made the mistake of simply mailing out a absentee ballot to every single registered voter, well, if you're a fraudster and you get hold of that absentee ballot, you've got 90% of the information you need to fill it out because the name's going to be on the outer envelope and their registered address. Let's, let's follow the track of these mail-out ballots, right? Let's just say you got students on a campus, they've voted, but then they graduate and obviously they move to a different state. If they're on the voter rolls, is it not a fact that mail ballots will be arriving in the dorms and arriving in, and, and so presumably they're not going to be that hard to scoop up if somebody knows how where to, where to look for them? No, that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, I work in the District of Columbia. They mailed out absentee ballots uh, to all of their registered voters. And I can't tell you how many phone calls I got from people that I know saying that not only had their ballot arrived in the mail, but five, six, seven ballots all coming into their apartment for people who used to live there. Now, a former Supreme Court justice in Wisconsin named Gableman has done a preliminary report. He talks about the fact that there are approximately 90,000 people in Wisconsin who are in uh, resident care facilities or nursing homes. So she's uh, basically not capable any longer of even remaining awake for more than a few minutes. And so were you surprised that she voted in February 2021? <laughs> Absolutely. But I was surprised to hear that she voted in the last presidential election. Much to my surprise, she had voted for the last, off and on for the last 10 years. I guess in my mind, I thought if you put your parent into a facility because they were incapacitated, they would not even be offered um, the vote. They make you vote. They make you vote here? And, and, and uh, so how do they make you vote? Because I didn't want to vote and they told me I had to. That is a real problem. Clearly it was a problem in Wisconsin 2020, but unfortunately that's a perennial problem in other states too. What happens is you have staff in those nursing homes. Sometimes they are activists politically. They get these individuals registered to vote, or if they're already registered to vote, they will request absentee ballots in their name, sometimes forging their signatures, and then filling out the ballots for them. Just prior to the 2020 election, the state of Texas indicted a social worker in a home for young people who were basically mentally incompetent. She had sent in over a hundred voter registrations for these individuals who were not legally competent to vote. What about homeless shelters? You know, look, if a homeless individual is uh, mentally capable, they ought to be able to vote. And if the only place they can list is a registered address, the homeless shelter, that's fine. But the problem there is that it's very easy, I think, for them to be intimidated and coerced. In Chicago, the largest election fraud case the U.S. Justice Department ever prosecuted, they were paying homeless individuals to cast ballots the way they wanted them to cast ballots. What made you want to do this? What made you want to get involved? Um, well, I knew election stuff was supposed to be something good to do, and then plus I needed a little extra money to get Christmas for my son. So that's why the main reason I did that. Who do these fraudsters pick on? 
They pick on the most vulnerable in our society. They go into poor neighborhoods. They pick on the elderly. They pick on people for whom English is not their first language. When we're trying to stop election fraud, we're actually trying to protect, uh, I, I'd say, the most vulnerable people in our society. We now know where the ballots could have come from, but to pull off a heist like this on a national scale would take deep pockets. I wanted to find out where the money might have come from. Who could have funded the heist? I met with Scott Walter, an old colleague of mine at the American Enterprise Institute, who is now head of the Capital Research Center. This is an organization that has produced multiple reports on the funding of elections. People think of three rivers of money, really, that empty into the gulf of elections. The hard dollars to write a check to a candidate. The second, you hear soft money or dark money. And then there's a third river that people tend to neglect, but Capital Research Center has studied intently, and that is the 501c3 nonprofit money. The kind of charity that you get to take a tax deduction for. That river is enormous. In the 2018 cycle, about $21 billion. Now, what do the IRS regulations say about the involvement of these nonprofits? By law, these nonprofit charities are forbidden to directly intervene in elections in any way or to help a particular party or candidate. The IRS is emphatic that you cannot intend or even have the effect of helping one party or candidate over the other. Now, let's talk about some of the key elements of this particular network that we're focusing on. We have, we have drop boxes, and those drop boxes are, most people would think, funded entirely by the states. In other words, the drop boxes in Georgia are funded by the state of Georgia, but that's not entirely the case, is it? In the 2020 election, there was an unprecedented hundreds of millions of private dollars going into government election offices. The 470 million or so dollars were sent by Mark Zuckerberg and his wife. We did our part to secure the integrity of the election. There were a few other places that put in much smaller amounts. One entity that put in $25 million was, again, a nonprofit that's part of the Arabella Advisors, which as a total empire in 2020 took in $1.7 billion. Is there any evidence that this operation had a partisan thrust or a partisan character. As we all know, big money rarely comes without strings attached. One of the big ones is lots and lots of drop boxes. Also, lots and lots of vote by mail. To get your nice big checks, you had to do things like have drop boxes, encourage vote by mail, have ads in foreign languages, all kinds of things that little by little are nudging the turnout for one particular political party. In addition to the 470 or so million dollars that went into the Zuckbuck operation, you also had in 2020 a 120 million dollar project, very secretive, called the Voter Registration Project. The 120 million, it came from Soros' foundation, it came from Visa's foundation, it came from Warren Buffett's foundation, it came from unions like the SEIU. The Voter Registration Project has as its goal increasing in the eight target states over two million voters who are overwhelmingly expected to vote for the Democratic Party. And so the states that we're talking about here, Arizona? Yes. Georgia? Yes. North Carolina? Yes. Any others? Nevada, New Mexico. Here we've got an operation of illegal vote trafficking. You've got thousands of mules that are being paid to do this. What you're saying is there is more than enough money available to fund any such operation. In fact, this would be only one part of a much larger uh, effort to control the election. We are talking half a billion dollars in nonprofit charitable funds flowing into efforts to register and get out the vote for Democrats.
Democrats. Most of the left-wing mainstream media, when they reported on the Zuckbox going through, they said they made it sound like, oh, it's all going to go for masks and, you know, plexiglass and all. And every study that's ever been done of some of those grants to the big cities found a few percent, maybe, going to help people that way and the massive amounts of money going into ginning up the vote-by-mail operation and the Dropbox operation and those sorts of things that benefit one political party. How confident should we be that this will be a fair election? They're sending millions of ballots all over the country. This is going to be a fraud like you've never seen. Trump predicted. He said the Democrats are going to cheat, that they're going to use the pretext of COVID, they're going to rig the rules in their favor. Nevertheless, Republicans focus their efforts on the campaign while Democrats focus their efforts on the process of actually running the election. The two sides don't approach elections in the same way. The Democrats, they understand that the rules, the process by which elections are conducted is just critical. We must now face the chilling reality. The Democrats conceived the heist. They funded it. They organized it. Then they carried it out. They rigged and stole the 2020 presidential election. We cannot be okay with this. We cannot simply move on. Guys, I'd like to have your honest assessment on what you've seen, what you've heard, and what we can reasonably draw from it. What do we have empirically? We have data geolocated. We have footage of people harvesting ballots. Do we know who those ballots were for? We can't know who they were for. However, you have to inject common sense. Are we saying that in the centers of Democrat-held districts, we are seeing hundreds and hundreds of visits to drop boxes with pro-Trump ballots? It beggars belief. It's ballot loan looks pretty convincing to me. We don't, we'll, I don't think we'll ever know the full story. And what makes this crime so compelling and unique is that once the ballot en enters the system, it's really hard to reverse engineer it. But when you have the cell phone geolocation data and then the actual footage of them doing what you would expect them to be doing, taking pictures of the ballots, taking gloves off, visiting multiple times, I mean, it seems pretty clear to me. And it explains the sudden spike in... Biden's support that we saw late at night, the kind of instinct that people had. The control of the U.S. Senate went through Georgia with Chuck Schumer's majority leader, probably because of what we just saw. And I'd like them to answer the mules. If they say it's clean, then then be honest and say, okay. They have two ways they try, they'll try to invalidate it. One is minimizing and then slander. Yep, right. So they'll try to slander Dinesh personally. They'll say, oh, Trump pardoned him or whatever. Therefore, he's trying to get back at Trump to try to reinforce the big lie. I could already see the headline in the Washington Post. Trump pardoned ally comes out with questionable movie. I predict right now they will say, what on earth is a conservative doing tracking private citizens? Gee, how dang, what is Dinesh D'Souza doing to voters at 3 a.m.? In fact, I mean, th that'll be part intimidation of it. Intimidation will be the word. Right. The word will be intimidation. They'll say no person is safe. Communities of color are being tracked. People like in black neighborhoods are now going to have to fear for their life that their cell phone pings will be paired. And this is this is Jim Crow 2.0 to Dinesh. I disagree that this is not going to be compelling enough. This is a smoking gun. This is O.J. Simpson being seen leaving the scene of the crime. I don't care how partisan you are. You can't dismiss all of this. How do you explain somebody going to a whole bunch of different drop boxes with a whole bunch of different ballots on the same night at 3.57 a.m. in the morning? How do you explain that? That alone. I'm sorry. I think a whole bunch of people in this country are going to go, oh, my God. I think that if every American saw that, I think, I think it, would, it would move the needle. However, their ability to keep their side ignorant yeah. is, is total. That's going to be impossible to keep a lid on this thing. Well, this movie is an Overton window moment, right? So documentaries can do this every once in a while. Michael Moore did it. He moved the Overton window on many different topics 20 years ago. Al Gore did it with climate change. It'll happen, as Ernest Hemingway said, gradually and then suddenly. Because it's not just how many people are going to watch this film, it's who's going to watch it. It's going to be lawmakers. It's going to be people that work for the Bureau. It's going to be someone somewhere with a conscience that has power and say, this is a problem. It can't be dismissed. And it can't be dismissed. They have ruined 
election day in the United States of America. That's provable. And that's enough for me to fight the left with every fiber in my body. Without free and fair elections, we are not a democracy. We are a nation run by a criminal cartel masquerading as a democracy. Never in U.S. history has a presidential election been as thoroughly corrupted by coordinated fraud across multiple states as we now know took place in 2020. Today, totalitarian regimes camouflage their fake elections with appearance of democracy, but they're not real democracies. We don't want to join them. Our elections must represent the will of American citizens. We who believe in constitutional democracy must be diligent. If we give up, they win. In fact, if enough of us give up, they won't need to cheat anymore. Don't stay home. Get involved. Get out and vote. Do what is necessary to save this great country. The America we love needs us now more than ever. Mm-hmm.